those of you that don't know who Dr. Sachin Panda is, I've done a couple of podcast episodes with him over the past few years. He's a pioneer in time-restricted eating and also an expert on circadian rhythms. If you don't know what either of those things are, don't worry. We're going to get into those shortly. We'll talk all about optimizing circadian rhythms and sleep and time-restricted eating and how time-restricted eating relates to circadian rhythms and just a lot of really cool stuff. So maybe we should go ahead and uh, get started. And uh, again, as Sachin mentioned, he... He's a professor at the Salk Institute and runs a phenomenal laboratory there where he is publishing extremely high impact studies and that really, you know, have a major impact on public health. So maybe we can start chatting a little bit about the world of chronobiology and circadian rhythm. I mean, many people listening to this conversation may have a general sense of what a circadian rhythm is, but uh, a lot of people have never heard of it. So Maybe you can sort of explain what it is, Sachin, why they're important. Yeah, so just uh, imagine if you have to do a lot of different things in a day, uh, you just can't do them at random. So that's why you come up with a calendar and put what time you want to do certain things uh, so that you are more productive. So similarly, our body does jillion different tasks in a given day. Um, for example, there are dozens of hormones that are many digestive juices, then there are brain chemicals, there are genes that have to turn on and off. So that's why our body also has a daily timetable that repeats itself every single day. So that's why the term circadian rhythm, circadian literally means approximately a day and rhythm is rhythm. So this is a timetable that repeats every single day. So what it means is the First thing that comes to your mind is sleeping because sleeping is a big chunk of time that our body devotes to at a specific time of the night. So similarly, almost every organ in our body, whether it's liver, kidney, heart, or even your skin, or even your hair follicle has to do certain tasks. So that means every single organ, every single cell has its own daily timetable or circadian rhythms. What's so interesting is that everything from, like you said, you know, every organ in your body has a circadian rhythm. And I find it like when you think about when you're, a lot of people are interested in when their optimal peak cognitive performance, you know, occurs. A lot of people take nootropics or they'll drink caffeine or, you know, do a variety of things to try to improve their cognitive performance. But even the time of day actually is important for that, right? Yeah, so just like the brain has to sleep for certain hours at night, it also has a narrow window in the first half of the day when it has the best cognitive ability, problem-solving ability. And maybe that's why, Rhonda, you just scheduled a call at this time of the day yeah. <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> and uh, what happens is when we don't sleep enough, then our brain is foggy and we just can't think clearly, and people think that by drinking a cup of coffee, we can start thinking clearly, which is actually not true. Caffeine just wakes up our brain, but it doesn't make us to think clearly. And those experiments have been done extensively, so we have to still respect the number of hours we sleep the previous night to be fully awake and to be fully functional. And what about the time of day in terms of like when neurotransmitters are being produced? Like, is there a circadian rhythm to that as well? Yeah, almost every neurotransmitter has a um, circadian rhythm. Um, when I say every neurotransmitter, it's not only the neurotransmitter, it may be the receptor that receives the signal from neurotransmitter or the system that recycles the neurotransmitter. Any one of them can have a circadian rhythm. So that means at a certain time of the day, we are more prone to feel happier. At a certain time of the day, we may be more prone to feel a little sad. Those things are ingrained in our, in our circadian rhythms. Some people are natural early risers and, you know, other people's, people are night owls. Like for me, like I'm a pretty normal riser. I mean, like I, I guess ever since I had children, I started to wake up earlier than usual, but I usually I'm up around 7 a.m. Yeah. And I find that my peak mental performance is sort of late 
morning ish, you know, like around 10, I start to, I feel like I'm the most mentally alert, but what about, you know, people that are naturally early risers or people that are night owls. And so they, they wake up much later in the day. Is it a good idea for them to force themselves to wake up early or? Well, one thing is, um, irrespective of whether you are early riser or late riser, uh, what matters um, much more important is how many hours you sleep. And many sleep scientists would agree that uh, an adult should sleep around seven hours. So that means if you're in bed for eight hours, then you'll get approximately seven hours of um, restful sleep. So now let's go back to early risers or night owls. Night owls, um, they may be night owls for many different reasons. One, uh, they may be genetically programmed to be night owl, and that number seems to be extremely low because um, many people who think they are genetically programmed to be a uh, late nighter, they turn out to have certain other things, for example, caffeine habit or binge watching movies or even having some work at home that keeps them awake till late night. And the challenge for night owlers is, although they are night owls, the whole world is programmed to start, uh, or your work is more likely to start at 8 a.m. So that means you have to get up and start your day around 7, 6.30 or 7 a.m., depending on your commute time. So um, the late nighters, therefore, have a big challenge that if they cannot go to sleep before, say, 1 a.m. in the morning, then they're not getting enough sleep. And that becomes very challenging for them to function at peak human performance on the following day. So, so that way, um, what might be a potential solution is to figure out whether, to figure out what is the cause of your night owl habit. Um, a lot of people may or may not pay attention to the idea that a lot of people we have a cup of coffee or tea in the evening, late afternoon, or when we socialize, um, we drink caffeinated drinks or even chocolate or hot chocolate that can keep us awake. Um, then the second thing is we also are exposed to a lot of bright light in the evening. A lot of people I have seen, if they take care of the lighting and caffeine, then they become quote unquote normal. So that means they can uh, go to sleep, say, between 9.30 and 11.30 so that they can get seven hours of restful sleep and that way they can function normally on the next day. So um, that's kind of my long, windy answer to a very simple question, how night owls can manage their human performance every single day. You brought up a lot of really important points. For one, you're talking about avoiding bright light or blue light exposure in the evenings. And um, some people may not be familiar with why that is. So a key driver of the body's circadian rhythms is melatonin, which, you know, people probably have heard of. It's a sleepiness hormone, but um, it rises towards the evening because it blue light, you know, inhibits it. So can you talk a little bit about maybe that and perhaps even the opposite of avoiding bright light in the, mo uh, in, in the evening would be actually seeking it out in, in the morning? Yeah, so uh, this uh, discovery of melanopsin or the blue light receptor was um, considered to be one of the top 10 breakthroughs of the year in 2001 when three different labs, including mine, we discovered it. Uh, to give you a context, if you're living in the nature, you don't have access to electrical lighting, then the day length changes between summer and winter. And accordingly, our sleep and wake up time also has to change, our circadian rhythm has to adjust to this changing day length. So as a result, our nature has, uh, we have evolved to have this light sensor, this specialized type of light sensors. Uh, these are called melanopsin or blue light sensing light sensors that are present in our retina. These are not necessary for seeing the outside world, but these light sensors sense blue light. And why blue light? Because the sunlight is the best source of blue light. When we say blue, it's around 450 nanometer to 500 nanometer, that trends. So these light sensors in our retina, they actually are slightly different because they need a um, good dose of blue light 
when I say good dose, that means as, for example, in a full moon night, your regular light sensors can help you find a way uh, or you can take a walk. Uh, but that level of light is not enough to activate melanoxin. So that means if you stay awake and you are taking a night hike in a full moon night, it's not going to reset your circadian clock. Now, fast forward a few years, what we understand now is this melanoxin blue light sensor actually senses light, bright light um, during the daytime or blue light from electrical lighting and then tells our master circadian clock in the brain, uh, depending on what time it is, I might say, hey, it may not be evening, it's actually extension of the day, it's a long summer day, so please stay awake. Or at the same time, it can also send a signal to this melatonin, which is the sleep hormone, because when melatonin goes up, um, we tend to feel sleepy. It tells melatonin that, hey, it's not time to go up because it's just a long summer day. So that's the way this blue light sensor in our retina connects to our brain to tell, to reset our clock, or to tell when melatonin should rise or fall. So now, what are the functional consequences or how we can use this information in everyday life? Uh, one is, since melatonin has to rise, or melatonin rise correlates very well with uh, how we fall, feel sleepy and how we fall asleep, it's a good idea to let it rise naturally so that we can fall asleep. And to let it rise naturally, we have to release the break. And the break here is blue light. And that's why dimming down light in the evening is a good idea to release that break so that melatonin can begin to rise. And since we know that this is blue light, that's the cause of suppressing melatonin, we can also do another thing. We can change the color of the light. And based on this science, uh, almost all the cell phones, all laptops now have a night shift or night light feature. And you can program it to turn it on around eight or nine o'clock in the evening when these um, screens will dim down and will turn a little orange in color. They may or may not help you to increase your melatonin, but at least they will um, signal that it's time to wind down and go to bed. Then conversely, during daytime, it's very important to get a good dose of bright daylight. Um, so that means if you are sitting next to a window, large window and having your breakfast, although you don't have sunlight falling on your eyes, you still get around 1000 locks of daylight. And if you have that exposure for half an hour to an hour in the morning, then that's pretty good enough to, again, put a strong break on melatonin, which might be slowly going down in the morning. And at the same time, that melanopsin receptor, it does slightly different things during daytime. It um, sends a signal to the brain to increase alertness and make us more functional. So it reduces depression and makes us more happy. So that way we can use this information that we learned from a very fundamental discovery in neuroscience to our advantage by getting at least 30 to 60 minutes of daylight, even sitting next to a large window during the first half of the day and dimming down light and maybe switching to yellow or orange shifted light or wearing even blue filtering eyeglasses in the evening to improve our sleep. So a couple of questions. One, you mentioned wearing the blue filtering glasses at night, um, perhaps to filter out some of the blue light. What about avoiding sunglasses early in the day to make sure you're activating the melanopsin receptor and, and getting that resetting of the circadian clock? Uh, great question, because we also have to strike the balance between protecting our eyes and getting enough blue light. Uh, so let's uh, talk about some actual numbers of how much light we experience. So if you are outside in a sunny day in California, or sunny day in any place, and if you're looking at the sky, not actually not looking at the sun, 
you get somewhere between 100,000 to 200,000 lux of light. It's a very simple calculation. And if you're inside your car and there is no direct sunlight falling on your face or inside your car, and you're just driving, looking horizontally, then you're you're getting somewhere between 5,000 to 10,000 lux of light, which is similar to standing outside your car in a cloudy day. That's also 5,000 to 10,000 lux of light. So now in a cloudy day or sitting inside your car, there is not enough UV light to hit your eye and damage your cornea or damage your skin. So in that case, driving without sunglasses is fine because you are not getting too much UV light exposure. But if you are in the beach or you are outdoor skiing in a very sunny day and you have a lot of UV exposure, then it may not be a good idea to abandon your sunglasses. Interesting, because the uh, singlet oxygen produced by blue light can damage yeah. the, the rods like and UV cones. light, there is a ton of UV light outside to and what about um, on the flip side of that, you know, people actually being exposed to the bright light in the evening oftentimes think, well, I can take a melatonin supplement and, you know, that should sort of help me increase my melatonin. Um, but is there a difference between the melatonin produced in the pineal gland versus melatonin being made in your gut, which is something that is even produced from eating food that ha contains the amino acid tryptophan, which gets converted into serotonin in the gut and ultimately into melatonin. You know, what, what are your thoughts on supplementing with melatonin maybe regularly or um, even is there like an age dependent factor in there? Yeah, so that's a very tricky question because, um, you know, melatonin is not regulated in the US, but in other countries it is regulated. And the reason why it's not regulated in the US is you can feed a lot of melatonin to a mouse and the mouse will never die. Um, in the sense, when you give various drugs or chemicals to an animal, then there is a LD50 or lethal dose 50 at which um, some animals would die. So based on that, we think that melatonin is safe. And of course, there is uh, not much adverse effect of melatonin shown in any major experiments. But having said that, um, we don't know what are the long-term adaptation of our body to melatonin, whether you start with a milligram of melatonin and your body will slowly uh, become resistant to that milligram and will need more and more. But at the same time, people think that melatonin is a good alternative to sleeping pill, which can have more adverse side effect. And maybe that's one reason why we have seen almost 40% to 60% rise in melatonin use in the last couple of years alone. So coming back to your question about melatonin, the natural melatonin versus um, supplementing melatonin with a pill, um, it's really hard to make those connections because, as you know, melatonin rises in the middle of our sleep and there's a kinetic to it. And it's not easy to detect melatonin. It's not like a continuous glucose monitor that you can stick to your arm and it will collect melatonin better because melatonin is present in such a low concentration that it needs more fancy method to detect it. So that means we have to sample blood in every 30 minutes or an hour when we are sleeping and then use that in an expensive method to measure melatonin. And that might be one reason why not much studies have been done to differentiate between um, exogenous application or taking a melatonin pill versus pineal melatonin. The second thing is when we take a melatonin pill, nearly 70 to 90% of it is uh, broken down in the liver and kidney within an hour. So whatever we take, only a small fraction of it stays in our bloodstream during our sleep. So as a result, melatonin in experimental, you know, like in clinical studies has been shown to improve sleep latency. So that means it can help to people to fall asleep, but it may not be that good in sustaining sleep throughout the night. At least that's what the clinical studies have shown. 
but in some people they they feel that melatonin helps them to stay asleep throughout the night and uh, unlike um, unlike this um, pill um, our endogenous melatonin actually rises roughly a couple of hours before our habitual sleep time um, it slowly rises and then it reaches almost its peak up to in one hour into our sleep and maintains that peak throughout the night and after we wake up uh, around that time it begins to decline and it, and it goes down to its lowest plateau, lowest level uh, maybe two hours after we wake up whereas if you take a pill it will just spike for 15 minutes to one half an hour just after you took the pill and then it will come down and slowly continue to go down throughout the night and by the morning when you get up uh, there might be very little depending on how much melatonin you took these days a lot of people are and actually there is a shift in the dosing of melatonin for example almost 20 years ago when i was a student i could find one milligram melatonin pill and it was very difficult to find a three milligram pill and now it's almost impossible to find a one milligram pill in any drugstore and the common is around three to five milligram pill. So that means when people are taking this five mig, it's possible that they have a very huge spike. And then when it comes down, it actually stays at a pretty high level throughout the night. And maybe even two to three hours after they wake up, they still have significant amount of melatonin in their system. So unfortunately, these are some of the studies that need to be done and have not been systematically done. What's interesting about what you just said about them, poss- you know, it possibly the melatonin levels being um, elevated even, you know, two to three hours after waking up. Uh, you have previously said um, in another podcast, uh, you've talked about how melatonin actually can inhibit the secretion of insulin from the beta cells in the pancreas, the beta islet cells in the pancreas. And that would uh, obviously affect your glucose, blood glucose levels. Do you think, um, you know, avoiding eating food, even like waiting an hour or two before or after you wake up, uh, before you start to eat, would be something that would be helpful for, you know, regulating glucose levels? Yes, this uh, connection between melatonin and glucose is relatively new because in 2009, simultaneously four different papers came out from human genetic studies showing that um, people with diabetes or increased fasting blood glucose level have a polymorphism or mutation in the melatonin receptor gene. And that was really perplexing because until then, melatonin was supposed to have its function only on sleep. And people never thought that it can affect blood glucose. And then from 2009 till, say, 2015, 16, there are a lot of studies that started to understand why melatonin affects blood glucose. And slowly, a much better picture is emerging. That is, melatonin, just like it makes our brain to sleep, it also makes our pancreas to sleep, uh, or islet cells to sleep. That means it uh, makes this insulin producing cells less responsive to glucose so that they don't produce as much insulin as they should when we eat something that has carbohydrate or glucose. So that means that if our melatonin level is high in our system and we eat something um, and blood glucose level goes up, the beta cells can sense that blood glucose but they cannot produce or release enough insulin since the function of insulin is to absorb some glucose into muscle cells, into many different types of cells, without that glucose being absorbed, it stays in our blood system, so our blood sugar level rises. And to make it even more complicated, uh, going back to the discovery of that melatonin receptor uh, variant, nearly one third of the population have that variant. So that means they're more likely to be influenced by this relatively benignly moderate 
the high level of me melatonin being in their system and not being able to control their blood glucose. So it might be difficult to go get yourself genotyped and figure out whether we are more or less sensitive, but then the bottom line is um, there's a consensus that one should not eat too close to bedtime when our melatonin levels may be high. And that's when if we eat, then our blood glucose level may remain high. In fact, this has been experimentally shown almost half a century ago. Um, in 70s and 80s, there was this uh, there was this talk that evening diabetes so that means you go in the morning to a to a clinic and get a bolus of glucose and then after 90 minutes you measure your blood sugar level it may come down to normal level but the same person if he or she goes to the clinic in the evening or late night gets the same bolus of glucose and after 90 minutes the blood glucose may remain at a high level, which would qualify him or her to be diabetic. So that's, and um, even now people observe the same effect. Uh, so that means in late night, a body cannot respond to glucose and produce enough insulin. And now we are coming to understand at least part of it is due to melatonin. So now coming back to your question, uh, yes, th that's why we suspect that people who get up and immediately eat something that has sugar or carbohydrate, then they may not be able to completely bring down that blood glucose level in the next 60 to 90 minutes. So that's why it might be a good idea to wait for an hour or two after waking up for the nightly melatonin levels to come back to daytime level before you eat. And conversely, at night also, it's a good idea to not eat or drink anything that has carbohydrate or glucose uh, two hours before bedtime. What about maybe eating a um, higher fat meal in the morning as opposed to eating something with more carbohydrates or glucose? Well, so this is where we have to think um, numbers. So, you know, for example, if... Uh, if you drain all of my blood, you'll get five liters of blood. And if my safe blood sugar level is 100 milligram per deciliter, so that means from that five liter of blood, you'll get five gram of sugar. And if you add one more gram of sugar, then my blood sugar level will become 120 milligram per deciliter. So that's the almost the definition of diabetes. What it means is if I, in the morning, if I eat even anything that has one gram of sugar, that's one fifth of a teaspoon, and my pancreas is not at all functioning, and none of the blood sugar is absorbed by any cell, then I will have dangerously high level of blood sugar. So when we think of fat-rich food, except for pure fat, I think almost every other food will have some carbohydrate. And that carbohydrate will be more than a gram of, equivalent to one gram of sugar or carb. So that's why we have to be a little bit careful in recommending what people should be eating because even with that fat or protein rich diet, even if you are having a couple of boiled eggs with a toast, that toast has enough carbohydrate to trigger and that needs to be absorbed properly. Good point. Shifting back to the melatonin and you know its role in circadian rhythm, there are a lot of people that are, you know, have altered circadian rhythms because either they are shift workers, or perhaps um, they've traveled into you know to another time zone. Can you maybe first kind of just define a little bit and explain why you know some people actually may be shift workers without even realizing it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I said that almost all of us are shift workers because the definition of shift work uh, is very, I mean, if you strictly go by what is a shift work, then you it's very hard to get a clear definition because some may be working very early in the morning, some may be working, someone may be working late in the evening or some may be night shift workers. So that's why the international level organization and some of the European countries, they have come up with a, 
working definition of shift work, which means, um, which essentially translates to a very simple term, like if you stay awake for two to three hours between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. for 50 days in a year, so that is on an average one day in a week, then you may be considered as a shift worker. Now, if you think about yourself, almost all of us um, kind of either we go to bed very late or we wake up very early to do something, to take care of some someone or to finish an assignment very frequently. So that's why I say that all of us may be shift worker. And why this two to three hours? Because if we delay our sleep by two to three hours at night, or we wake up two to three hours before our usual wake up time, then when we when we are awake in this modern days, we're usually exposed to light, or we try to stay awake by eating or drinking some coffee, and all of these events actually try to reset our clock. And it takes almost two days to adjust to a two hours change in wake up time or two hours change in sleep time. So that means by disrupting our sleep wake cycle just for one day, we perturb our circadian rhythm for the next two to three days. So we are not in our, our daily habits are not in alignment with our internal clock for those two to three days. So that means that boils down to 40 to 50% of the week we may be out of sync, including the day on which we disturb our clock. So that's why um, we have to keep in mind what is the definition of this shift work and how we all may be shift workers because even if you stay awake for a couple of hours extra to socialize and have a late night dinner, uh, you may be living the life of a shift worker. Is there anything we can do to sort of mitigate the negative effects? Or is yeah, it just I mean, sort of don't? Is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so that's that's the thing that, uh, you know, we built this anthropogenic world in the post-industrial era without knowing the relevance or the significance of circadian rhythm in our life. So that's why our personal choices are the way we run our um, live in the family, or the way we socialize, or the way we even pick to do a job, whether it's a night shift worker or we just stay awake late into the night, binge watching, or, or as a professor or teacher correcting grades. Uh, all of these um, are based on the lack of knowledge of circadian rhythm and how it is important. So in that way, I always say that uh, we're experiencing what I call the late and asbestos moment in human health, because until 1970s, we thought that lead and asbestos are safe and we could use them in any building construction. So similarly, without knowing the relevance of circadian rhythm, we thought that it's just a momentary discomfort to stay awake for a couple of nights or to do a shift work, or we connected um, late night socializing and binge eating with some food hangover <laughs> that will go away after a day or so. Uh, but now we are realizing that these are serious issues. So that's why it will take um, maybe a decade, <laughs> three or four decades to build a rebuild an anthropogenic world that actually nurtures our circadian rhythm. So a few things we can do is if you want to socialize in the weekend, then instead of choosing to socialize late into the night, uh, try to go for the happy hour. I mean, the food is cheap and <laughs> you can finish your dinner early and you can still go back to sleep at the regular time. And when it comes to shift work, then um, we have to keep in mind that uh, we have to be extra careful than people who are doing daytime job and we have to stay away from, say, caffeinated drinks and a lot of alcohol um, because shift work combined with alcohol or too much caffeinated drink is uh, quite toxic to our body. It disturbs our sleep-wake cycle and um, we are actually more sensitized to be damaged by alcohol if we're doing shift work. Um, then we have to choose, judiciously choose what time we eat or sleep and try to be within that window 
almost every single day, even on the off days. It's relatively easy to do that if you're a morning or evening shift worker, but for night shift worker, it's very difficult. So that may be something that you can even bring up with your employer to see whether you can be on night shift continuously for several days so that your body adjusts to night shift and then come back to um, few days of off days. And this is a method that's used in many countries where people stay on night shift or 24 hour shift even for several days in a row. Uh, and then they come back and take off days for, for a week or two. So there are multiple methods. Um, but anyways, this is it's still a new field of science and we're still learning how to come up with personal habit, family rituals and societal norms to adjust to or to re reduce the incidence of circadian rhythm disruption and adopt habits that will make us resilient against circadian rhythm disruption. I find for myself, um, as a parent now, I, you know, my, my sleep is very beholden to what my child does. And or when my child, you know, wakes up, you know, I have to wake up um, for the most part unless, you know, he's, he stays quiet for an hour, which sometimes he does. But, um, you know, so like when I put my son down for bed, you know, I have an option. I can watch a show that I'm really into and I've been waiting to see the next episode of. And uh, in fact, it's a very stimulating show. So, you know, I, I find myself, if I watch it, I, of, I often want to, as you said, binge watch. I want to watch the next episode and, and just go to bed an hour later or maybe two hours later. And I find that, um, because I have to wake up and, you know, people have all sorts of reasons they have to wake up, like you mentioned work and, you know, children and, you know, and also in my case, I don't have any blinds on my windows in my bedroom. And so I wake up sort of gently when the sun comes out, um, which means that if I go to bed later, I will be losing sleep because I wake up at the same time pretty much because the light's coming in. So do you, do you think that also just maybe of avoiding some of these stimulating shows, like TV shows at night, you know, it's kind of a trade-off because on the one hand, you're kind of relaxing and you're forgetting all the worries of work and you're kind of immersing yourself in this other world, um, you know. But the flip side of that is you're also probably stimulating yourself more and um, maybe getting a little bit of blue light from the TV screen and then going to bed later. Yeah, so you, you kind of uh, touched on many, many important issues. Uh, you pointed out how after your son goes to bed, that's the only free time you have. And that's true. Um, in fact, the social scientists, they agree that nighttime is the time of free freedom, human expression, human creativity, because this is when um, a lot of people who do a job that we don't like, <laughs> or um, people who care for other uh, children or um, people who are not well at home, uh, they get that free time late in the evening. And that becomes a challenging issue where to draw the boundary between your personal freedom of expression and enjoyment versus um, your personal duty to nurture your health. And if we think about circadian rhythm disruption, then it entirely boils down to how we manage those three to four hours of uh, freedom time after everybody, after we have finished doing what we are supposed to do for others, and we have that personal freedom time. And that's for a bigger discussion because uh, that involves many different issues. So coming back to the other side of the story, you said how you don't have blinds in your window, so you wake up at the same time every single morning. Um, that would be wonderful if you also have the freedom to go to bed at the same time every single day. So that's why uh, circadian rhythm disruption, uh, the, the fact that we are living like shift worker brings up another necessity that is we have to have complete control over our bedroom. We should be able to make that bedroom completely dark or um, inspiringly bright at any given time of the day or night. So this is where I always tell people that 
try to um, design your bedroom or at least have um, good blinds that will make the room completely dark, have uh, your plugs handy or an eye mask handy so that you can at least get those one or two hours of extra sleep during daytime uh, when it's difficult to fall asleep. So I guess just how to go to bed and how to wake up itself can be a separate topic for discussion. Yes, to absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to, to, to have darkness. There's not any street lights or anything, but I think I, I have blinds on the way because <laughs> I've realized that just that early morning sun, like there, there, I'm, I am missing out somewhat on a little bit of extra sleep I could get early in the morning when that sun is, is coming up. Uh, but you kind of mentioned something else, um, napping. Are naps beneficial? Of course, I mean, and if you are, if you're sleep deprived, then napping is a very good way to catch up with the lost sleep. And in fact, we are designed to be napping because we humans are not strictly diurnal. We are crepuscular. So that means we're more alert in the morning and evening and little less alert right after lunch. Um, our internal sleep pressure actually goes up physiologically right after lunch. So we are designed to have um, maybe 30 minutes to an hour of nap. Interesting. Do you, do you think part of the reason we are sleepy right after lunch, and you probably know the answer, but does it have anything to do with like a postprandial like glucose response or postprandial inflammation, or is it totally circadian regulated? Um, I think it's a combination of both because there is a sleep pressure. And if we if we have some food, then the postprandial change in physiology in combination of the sleep pressure make us sleepy. Um, so as a result, you can fight this off uh, many different ways. Um, for example, you can, you can have a smaller lunch so you don't have too much disturbance to your physiology and you can fight up that postprandial dip. Or um, since bright light actually makes us more alert than maybe having that um, lunch outdoor under a, under a canopy or maybe going for a short walk after lunch will keep you awake. What about offices? Are there any way we can optimize the light in, indoors? Yeah, so there are um, many new technologies and architectural designs that those are now coming into picture for office design. Um, the open office design and having large windows, those are all part of this new scheme. And the fortunate thing is now glass manufacturing has come to a point where glass can be both um, aesthetic as well as load bearing. So the, some of the glasses are strong enough that they can even take some of the loads of the building. So that enables designers to come up with large walls, which are just glass walls. Um, that will allow enough light to seep in. And then in large offices, having cubicles with enough headspace through which daylight can come through and kind of distribute throughout the large office space is helping to bring daylight at the same time, reduce energy bill by reducing artificial lighting. Uh, all of these are helping. Then at nighttime, um, there's also innovations in office space design, you can have light layering so that only you can have more personalized light because you can light up a cubicle or office with um, LED lights that can be dimmed or brightened up to the occupant's own choice. Uh, so there are a lot of innovations that will actually help to optimize this anthropogenic world for circadian uh, rhythms. And lighting itself is a $27 billion industry. And for the first time in human history, we have near complete control over the quality, quantity, and timing of light that we can have in our workplace or in our home. So there is there will be a lot more innovations in this area where maybe in future we can have, this, we can have our body sensors um, 
talking to the building sensors and building control system to automatically adjust lighting, adjust temperature that will not sure our health. What about in countries with very little winter daylight? I mean, is that is there something like like some sort of lights indoors that you can buy to kind of help you know simulate the daylight? Uh, yes, uh, if you look at many of the lighting, big lighting companies, they're actually from uh, those northern latitudes <laughs> because they have been experiment. I guess they have been experimenting with light for such a long time that they come up with all these innovations. And uh, the rule of thumb is if you go to buy, purchase a light bulb, then you'll see there are three different flavors of light. One that looks orange color and is very, um, very much like candlelight or firelight. And that's good for evening time in your bedroom or uh, wherever you don't like to have too much bright light. And then there is blue shifted light, which looks very blue, very alerting, super bright, white. And those are the lights that can help us in wintertime. Um, and many of the cold countries of northern latitude or extreme southern latitude countries, they have adopted to using light to uplift their mood. So uh, many of those designs now incorporate both um, orange shifted light and blue shifted light at different time of the day or in different seasons so that in winter time you can have more of the blue shifted indoor light uh, to improve your mood and alertness and even brighter light to improve your mood and alertness and conversely in summertime when the days are extremely long they're also adopting good window blinds window shades and orange shifted light to simulate evening time so that they can go to bed and they can get restful night of sleep. Cool. Kind of going full circle here, back to the circadian rhythms and how every organ in your body essentially is on a circadian rhythm and including your, you know, organs that are um, like your liver that are involved in metabolism. You mentioned when we were talking about shift workers, you know, people eating within a certain time window, so time-restricted eating. Most people here in the Clubhouse chat probably have heard of time-restricted eating. They're familiar with your, your work, um, but maybe we can kind of just briefly explain what it is and um, why eating within a more narrow window, window range, you know, your research has shown and others have to be beneficial. Yeah, so time-restricted uh, feeding or time eating is something that was, uh, I would say, discovered in our lab and the term was also coined in our publication. And it has been now used more loosely in popular culture as intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting, in fact, in scientific literature refers to alternate day fasting, uh, two days of fasting in a week or even periodic fasting where people fast for four or five days in two to three months. and But we didn't want to use the word fasting because fasting usually refers to reducing calories for one or more days. Whereas the term time restricting generally refers to eating within X number of hours where the X can be somewhere between eight to 12 hours in experimental models, preclinical models and without explicitly reducing calorie. And that's a big caveat between caloric restriction or scientific term intermittent fasting and time restricting. So now coming back to the science, why we think it is important, is if we think of why circadian rhythm is important, one big thing is um, circadian rhythms actually help us, help our body to repair and rejuvenate itself. For example, we always equate human body to a car or an engine, and we say how we describe how our body works by connecting it to an engine. But there's a huge difference between a car and, a, and our body, and that refers to you can start a car and take it for a spin at any time of the day or night, and it will function the same way. It will go from zero to 60 if you're riding a Tesla, maybe three and a half seconds or um, some other cars, maybe five to six seconds. It doesn't matter whether it's day or night. But our body doesn't work that way. Um, if I wake you up in the middle of the night and ask you to do 
a complex piece of math. You, you might take an hour, whereas in the middle of the day, it might take you only 15 minutes. So the reason being, uh, the car doesn't have to self-repair itself. Uh, we have to send the car to a body shop or to a repair shop to repair it once every three to four months or tune it up, whereas our body tunes up and repairs itself every single night. And that's why when we misuse our body, we have to send it to the body shop or repair shop, aka a hospital or emergency room. So that's why you don't want to use your body as a car. So now coming back to the repair and rejuvenation, now if you think of sleep as a perfect example, when we sleep, for seven hours or eight hours. During that seven to eight hours, our brain is repairing and rejuvenating itself by taking out the toxic materials, by uh, strengthening the synaptic connections or connections between our neurons and resynthesizing some of the neurotransmitters. All this repair and rejuvenation is happening for those seven to eight hours. So now, just like the brain, every single organ in our body also needs to repair and rejuvenate. And for that process to work, you don't want to, so just like the brain is unplugged from all the outside sensory stimulation for this repair to happen. Similarly, all the cells, all the organs in our body has to be unplugged from outside input. And one of the outside input that influences almost all of our organs is food, because when we eat, it changes quickly the levels of many hormones. It even changes the nutrient level and all cells in our body have to process, store, or break down, interconvert all the molecules that we get from our food. So that's why we need to stop eating. But then the question is, if our brain needs only seven to eight hours of sleep, why do we need 12 to 16 hours of no food. <laughs> and the answer is, when we eat, it takes at least five hours for our stomach to digest that food. And after five hours, then our intestine might take several hours to absorb nutrients, some of the nutrients, and then send them to our liver and other parts of the body. So that means if you finished your dinner at six o'clock in the evening, then your stomach is still working till 11 p.m. or even later. Um, so it's not actually getting to sleep or repair or rejuvenate itself. So that means how many hours you are not eating, you subtract at least five hours from that. That's the number of hours your organs are resting, repairing, or sleeping. So that's why if we eat for eight to 10 hours, then we give our organs some rest for 16 to mm -hmm. 14 hours, and that translates to roughly eight hours of really no digestion, no nutrition, interconversion, and that's the time our organs are getting to repair and reset, rejuvenate. So as an experiment, we have done this experiment in mice and fruit flies because we can control eating there. Uh, when we give mice ad libitum access to food, they can eat any time, then they will eat nearly 70 to 85% of the food during nighttime when they are awake, 15 to 30% of food during daytime when they typically sleep. And in this lifestyle, mice will slowly gain weight, they will slowly become diabetic, they will have high plasma fatty uh, acids that will make them prone to heart diseases, and many other bad things will happen. But if we feed the mice the same number of calories from the same diet source, whether it's healthy diet or unhealthy diet, um, and they get to eat all of that food within eight to 10 hours, then we can protect them from all these diseases. And if the mice are already having disease and we put them in time-restricted feeding for eight to 10 hours, we can reverse those diseases. And we have done a lot of molecular studies now, looking at different organs, looking at the whole genome sometimes, hundreds of metabolites, and we, we find the molecular mechanisms by which this time-restricting is triggering um, 
breakdown of toxic materials, uh, detoxification during the fasting time, better usage of fat, protein, and carbohydrate uh, during day and night, and improved um, um, improvement in metabolism and mitochondria function that reduces reactive oxygen species, uh, all of these good things, and improved autophagy. All of these things are happening when mice eat within 8 to 10 hours. And some of these have been now translated to human studies, and some of the pilot studies have come in. The results have come in. They're very promising, and some of the randomized clinical trials are ongoing, and hopefully we'll get those results uh, from 2021 onwards. And you've also found that people follow, generally speaking, um, uh, an eating pattern like if they're not trying to eat, you know, within a certain time window with your My Circadian Clock app, you found naturally people eat within a longer window than they th- thought they would eat in. Is that correct? Yes. So uh, when we started this human and mouse studies, uh, then we realized that we're kind of adding a another leg to human nutrition research. That is, we know that uh, the number of calories and the type of food that we eat have a huge impact on our health. And we just started when we eat is also important. Then it becomes an important issue to understand when people eat because we do have different methods. For example, 24 hours dietary recall to understand how much and what type of food people ate in the last 24 hours. Similarly, there are methods to measure what diversity of food people have eaten in the last three months or a year through a tool called Food Frequency Questionnaire, or FFQ. But there was no method to really understand when people eat. We can ask people, when did you eat breakfast? When did you eat lunch, dinner? Uh, But that doesn't give us the correct view because we often ignore the occasional eating or snacking that we might have done late at night or early in the morning, and we consider them to be benign and we don't report them. Uh, But as I mentioned, even one gram of sugar can change my blood sugar level. So we wanted to capture every single eating event that happens. And from circadian rhythm point of view, even if you ate or drank something that has calories, maybe two to three hours after your dinner time, just for one day in a week, that can have an impact on your circadian rhythm for two to three days. So even if people eat outside their usual dinner time or breakfast time for one or two days in a week, they might ignore it and may not respond to questions. Um, But if we can capture that, then we objectively know their eating pattern. So that's why we started this app called My Circadian Clock. People anywhere in the world can go to the website, sign up, for the study, it's a it's an academic study. There is no commercial interest here, and they share their data with us. What we found is nearly 50% of adults um, have an eating window of 15 hours or longer. So that means in a given week, there is a 95% chance that they would eat within that 15 hours window. Um, that means that if somebody wakes up around six o'clock and has a cup of coffee with cream and sugar, a little bit of sugar um, immediately after waking up, then uh, this person is also going to bed say at nine or 10 o'clock at night and is having a glass of milk or beer or something else that has some calories, then that is roughly 15 hours of eating window. And in, even if this person does this um, only a couple of times in a week, still the circadian system is anticipating that that's the eating window. So that way we developed this app to measure when people eat in addition to the tried and tested methods of what and how much we eat. And we figured out that nearly 50% of adults eat for 15 hours or longer, and only 10% of adults actually eat for 12 hours or less. Um, interval in a day. And what so, what percentage of people think they eat for 12 hours or less if you ask them without? Uh, that's uh, almost 100% because in this first study, when we took did the study on 156 people, we had a questionnaire where we asked them, what time do you eat your breakfast, lunch, and dinner? What is the interval of time when we eat, when you eat? And when we compare that, their own response 
it was only less than 5% of people who said that they eat for more than 13 hours. So what we perceive, how we eat, and how we actually eat is very different. And if all of your listeners, if you just think back and ask yourself, is there any day in the last seven days when you had a piece of uh, cookie or a glass of beer or wine a couple of hours after your dinner time, after your dinner was finished, I would guess that at least half of you would uh, remember at least one day in the last one week you had done that. And uh, this is almost like your body flying to a different time zone and coming back uh, from the circadian point of view. So that's why when we think of when we eat, it um, also brings up other aspects of the timing. And since the research is very new, it will um, have more variations to the timing. People will start thinking, okay, um, what happens if you eat after an hour of waking up versus six hours after waking up? What happens if you eat only two meals in a day versus six meals within that eight hours or 10 hours? Um, so all of these variations of human nutrition timing are yet to be fully studied, but it's, uh, I'm glad that our research has um, put focus onto this timing of food as a variable in health. Is it better to have an eating window that if, you, let's say, you're eating within a eight-hour time window and you'll, you know, you're quote-unquote not eating, I guess I, you're not eating for 16 hours. Is it better to stop that, have that eating window end at 7 p.m. versus, uh, let's say, 11 p.m.? Yeah, so, uh, so this is where biology and our human behavior and personal choices come into play. Um, for most of us, what we see from the app data is uh, there is a circadian pattern or the time of the day pattern to uh, what people typically eat. For example, if you ask what time of the day people are more likely to drink alcohol and have more sugary treat, it's between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. Uh, or midnight. So then, if you're eating alone and if you have complete control over your diet and you have this um, very strict diet regimen, what you want to eat, then it doesn't matter whether you are finishing dinner at 7 p.m. versus 11 p.m. But if you target that you are ending that eight or 10 hours window at 11 p.m., and that includes socializing with other people and sharing food, or being even influenced by what other people ordered for dinner, then you're likely to consume a lot of unhealthy food during that extra between that 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. So that's why uh, setting aside the biology in real human, in, in real world, uh, what time you end your dinner uh, will indirectly influence what type of food you are more likely to eat. So that's why we suggest that you try to finish that window relatively early so that one thing is you have less chance for consuming too much alcohol and unhealthy food. And second is your last meal is likely to happen at least two to three hours before your habitual bedtime so that you can have better night's sleep. What sort of time-restricted eating pattern do you follow, Sachin? <laughs> yeah, so I try to do uh, around 10 hours time restricting. Um, so that means if I start my breakfast around 8 o'clock, then I try to finish dinner by 6, 6.30. And um, what is interesting is if I occasionally eat at 8 or 9 o'clock, even if it's a small snack or something, then that night my sleep is bound to become really fragmented. So I have a negative feedback loop that if I eat late, then I won't sleep well, and then the next day will be really crappy. I need more caffeine and other stuff to stay awake. So that's my eating habit these days. Do you personally count um, caffeinated beverages that don't have any calories, like black coffee, uh, resetting your clock in the morning? Yes, there are actually studies showing that uh, a cup of coffee is equivalent to an hour or two hours of bright light. Um, that's the impact on circadian clock. So it does 
impact our sleep. Um, and definitely no coffee after two o'clock in the afternoon, because if I drink coffee after two o'clock, then um, my sleep will be really bad. Like the other day I had a cup of coffee actually around noon and that completely disturbed my sleep that night. So we do consider that coffee might disrupt your circadian rhythm, but at the same time, we understand that a lot of people cannot function without coffee, particularly uh, night owls who are getting less sleep. It's much better to be caffeinated than uh, be sleepy when you're driving to work. Um, also, some people, their, their work requires them to be completely alert. Uh, for example, people who work in the entertainment industry who have to go in front of a camera at four o'clock in the morning, if they don't have enough sleep, it's better to be caffeinated uh, to do your job, otherwise you lose your job. So we make those exceptions and in our studies, we ask all of our participants to log everything so that we can go back and redo the calculation to see whether caffeine intake, even without cream and sugar or with cream and sugar had any impact on time restricting, which led to some changes in health consequences. But I must say that since all of our studies are relatively small in number, and also the number of people who drink black coffee outside the eating window in our studies may be even smaller, we are yet to see um, strong statistical power to dissect this effect. Great. Um, what about have you seen any data? Or are you aware of any data suggesting any, you know, time restricted eating differences between men and women? Perhaps you know, you know, there's obviously a fasting component to time restricted eating when you're the, the part when you're not eating. Um, other than like pregnancy and breastfeeding, do you know of any concerns for women, for example, uh, regarding time restricted eating? Well, you know, time restricted eating is a very uh, loose and broad term. So that means um, even if somebody, as I said, only 10% of adults eat for 12 hours or less. So that means if somebody was eating for 16, 17 hours, even if they're pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, they can come down to say even 14 hours or 12 hours of eating or 13 hours of eating. And if they continue with that routine, uh, they may still see some benefit. Um, but for medical risk reason, we don't suggest that people who are pregnant or breastfeeding should even try to think of time restricted eating. Uh, but it's a common sense that if you adopt a good habit, even when you are expecting, uh, uh, when you are breastfeeding, even if it's 13 hours of eating and 11 hours of constant downtime, that will have an impact on the family because when your baby is uh, growing up, when they're three to five years of age, they will slowly pick up that habit of eating. So within 14 hours or 11 hours, and then slowly they can shrink. So now coming back to the adverse effects. So that's why I say that, you know, eating anyone from five year old to hundred year old can do 12 hours time restricted eating without much concern about adverse side effect, unless the person has type one diabetes which is equivalent to brushing your teeth once a day. <laughs> and if you are trying to do 10 hours time restricted eating, then it may be better that if you're, if you're breastfeeding or if you're pregnant, then it may not be the ideal time restricted eating window. 10 hours might be too restrictive. But for the rest of them, again, without type 1 diabetics, it might be brushing your teeth twice. <laughs> to take care of your health. And if you're doing eight hours time restricted eating, it's almost like brushing your teeth twice, brushing your teeth, taking too much care of your health. So um, if you can do it for lifelong, uh, then it may be better, but at the same time, be careful about not reducing your calories too much because occasionally we do see some people try to do time eight hours time restricted eating, at the same time reducing calories to almost 1,000 kilocal per day, and increasing their activity level, running half a marathon uh, once a week or uh, 5K three times a week. And that can adversely affect your 
body weight can affect even your bile acid metabolism and might increase risk for kidney stone so we don't don't try to combine too many things at the same time and 12 hours time restricting as i said maybe safe for most of us except the type 1 diabetic unless they have a continuous glucose monitor and they have some calories handy if they become hypoglycemic and you mentioned children 5 and over so do you think that's kind of much like your anecdote if you eat a snack or something uh, later in the evening, you have more fragmented sleep. Is that something that you think maybe hold true for, you know, younger children, like preschool age as well? Or um, is there any evidence of that? No, there is no, um, I don't think there is any evidence because it's very difficult to do studies on children. We don't want to uh, intervene too much. But if you think about the general recommendation is children of that age should sleep for nine to 10 hours every night. So if you're a good parent and you are putting your child to sleep for eight to 10 hours, then uh, hopefully you are not waking up your kid in the middle of the night to feed something. So they are fasting for say 10 hours when they're sleeping. And then after waking up, it's not that they wake up and immediately eat something. They have to brush their teeth and then maybe get cleaned up. And let's add one hour there. So that's almost 11 hours. And similarly, just before going to bed, uh, they might have half an hour to one hour before um, bedtime when they had their last calorie. So in that way, you can see how a five to 10 year old can easily fall into eating within 12 hours or say, 13 hours window, um, which is which is not that bad. It means if you put together the sleep hygiene and the common sense um, bedtime ritual and wake up time ritual, then you can easily see how you can maintain a 12 to 13 hours eating window for a five to 10 year old. So there's one more area I kind of just wanted to touch on mostly out of my own personal interest and that is exercise timing and the circadian clock. There's been a bunch of studies that have come out over the past few years suggesting there are better times for humans to exercise. Yes, so there are a lot of studies that are coming out showing that that by, uh, so the late afternoon or evening may be the best time for exercise. And there are many physiological reasons for that. One is for exercise, we need much better uh, muscle tone, joint flexibility, and less risk for injury. And all of these tasks align in the late afternoon because that's when our heart rate is relatively high, our core body temperature is warm. Um, we don't need that warming up that we typically need early in the morning, that much warming up. And a muscle tone is better, joint flexibility is much better, so our risk for injury is less. So that's why uh, all of the studies are finding that late afternoon exercise is much better. Uh, then the second, so this is for healthy people who are trying to trying to get the gold medal instead of silver, <laughs> or reducing the risk for injury. Then if we think of people who are sick or who are trying to manage their glucose, say people with diabetes, is late afternoon exercise better than early morning. And in fact, there is at least one study that came out of um, Stockholm showing that people who, the same people, when they did exercise, high intensity interval training in the morning versus the same people doing the same high intensity interval training in late afternoon, they found that people who did the morning heat interval training, the blood glucose level actually went up Whereas uh, doing the same exercise in the evening helped them to reduce their blood glucose level, 24 hours blood glucose, those who had diabetes. So that's a very strong result. And what we know is, as I said, our pancreas has a clock. That means the pancreas produces more insulin in the morning or the first half of the day. And the second half of the day, even in the absence of melatonin, it, it doesn't produce that much insulin as well as in the morning. So that means 
um, any help in managing glucose independent of insulin is much better in the evening. And when we exercise, our muscles actually take up a lot of glucose without the help of insulin. And this might be one reason why late afternoon, early evening exercise, or even brisk walking may be much more beneficial for people with diabetes in managing their blood glucose. So the bottom line is, whether you're healthy or less healthy, uh, it seems that late afternoon, early evening exercise is better. But at the same time, if you have time to exercise only in the morning, then you should not stop exercising. Go for that morning exercise. Completely agree. Uh, there was a very interesting, re very recent study showing that fat oxidation was about almost like 13% higher in the afternoon compared to the morning. But if you took in, if, if the participants took in, it was actually quite of a large amount of caffeine. 30 minutes before exercise in the morning, their fat oxidation was equivalent to if someone exercised in the afternoon without any caffeine. For me, I like to exercise like first thing in the morning. I'm sort of, you know, mostly fasted. I do have uh, a cup of coffee, but it's kind of nice to know that maybe that caffeine, and I don't, I don't exactly know the mechanism, but may actually boost the fat oxidation a little bit more than, you know, if, if it was just morning without the, the caffeine. Mm -hmm. And also just one more question about, there was another study showing that like performance, athletic performance actually varied depending on when a person wakes up. So like whether they're an early riser versus intermediate or late riser. And what was I thought was so interesting about that study is that their peak performance was very different. Um, so if it was like an early or intermediate riser, their peak athletic performance happened between five or six hours after they wake up. But if they were a late riser, their peak performance was almost 12 hours. That's 11 hours after they basically woke up. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was interesting. So last to kind of wrap up this this discussion, could you discuss some of your your circadian resolutions for 2021? Things maybe that anyone could use, anyone could follow as well? Yeah, so uh, we thought, okay, so how do we put all of this together? Because we talk about light, we talk about sleep, not having light exposure uh, before sleep, having light exposure during the day. Uh, it can be all confusing. So we thought, an ideal circadian day might be try to sleep for eight, try to be in bed for eight hours consistently every night. When I say consistently, try to go to bed within an hour window and stay in, be in bed for eight hours so that you can get seven hours, seven and a half hours of sleep if you're an adult. And then after waking up, try to avoid food for one to two hours because that's when your melatonin hormone is slowly going down and cortisol hormone is spiking. And then after waiting for an hour or two, have your first bite and then count eight, 10, 11, or maximum 12 hours. That's the window of time when you should be eating. And also make sure that the last bite or the last calorie is at least two hours before your bedtime. You don't want to have that last calorie too close to the bedtime so that you can avoid food and avoid bright light for two to three hours before bedtime. And then during the daytime, particularly in the first half of the day, if you can, um, try to go outside. Even if it's a cloudy day, there is enough light to uplift your mood because light is the best antidepressant. It's plentiful and free. You just have to step outside and when you're stepping outside, you can also take a brisk walk for 30 minutes. And um, that way you can get both your exercise and light dose of the day. So that's the um, bottom line. Eight hours in bed, wait for one or two hours before fast calorie, eat everything within eight to maximum 12 hours. No food and no bright light for two to three hours before bedtime and 30 minutes outdoor, brisk walking during the day. <laughs> Great pointers. So thank you so much, Sachin, for having this Clubhouse chat. Um, people can follow you, obviously, on Clubhouse, but you're also on Twitter, at Sachin Panda. Your website's mycircadianclock.org. Your book, which is fantastic, and I've, I read a couple of years ago, My Circadian Code, 
has a lot of the information we talked about today and so much more. Also, your ongoing crowdsourced uh, data using your My Circadian Clock app that's available on the App Store or Google Play. Is there anything else that people can, where people can find you or you want to direct them to? No, you had a very comprehensive list. <laughs> <laughs> we actually like when people, uh, you know, the My Circadian Clock app is an academic app, so it's not as fancy as some of the other apps. But um, I'm really grateful that thousands of people have shared their their eating habits, sleep habits, step habits, and their socioeconomic demographic information. And that has been extremely useful for um, many ongoing and future studies. Um, we have nearly now 10 different clinical studies going on in parallel on the My Circadian Clock app platform. Um, and then the book has been very gratifying because the book has been now translated to 10 different languages. And uh, through the book, I also came to, while writing the book, I also came to understand how to think of my experiments in the light of public health and whether we, whether we do an experiment in Drosophila fly or mouse, we're always thinking, is it going to have an impact? So that opened my eyes. And Rhonda, you are the first one who, I remember the first time I did a podcast that was with you. <laughs> that was the first time I didn't know what is a podcast. And I, when I got an email from Rhonda, I went back to the lab and I asked, what is a podcast? And a lot of people explained to me. And here we are again. So Rhonda, you're always ahead of all of us, and you are doing a fantastic job in communicating science to millions of people, because we scientists, we are not very good at that, and uh, science has to be disseminated, and thank you for doing such a fantastic, fabulous job. Oh, I appreciate that, Sachin. Thank you. And for those of you here on Clubhouse listening, you can, this conversation was recorded, and you can you can find that podcast um, on your favorite podcast player. Just search for Found My Fitness. You can also sign up for our newsletter on foundmyfitness.com and keep up to date with all the things we're doing, including podcasts uh, like this one. So um, thanks again, Sachin, and I look forward to talking to you soon um, and keeping up with all your wonderful research. Yeah, thank you, and have a perfect circadian day. All right, sounds good. You do the same. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.